And for those of you not familiar with the Michigan, Michigan, Michigan Municipal League, we are a statewide nonprofit association representing cities, villages, and towns uh, across the state of Michigan. Uh, we've been around 110 years, so uh, we're sustainable ourselves. And we provide a number of services uh, to our members, everything from education to advocacy to training. We're proud to be a sponsor of this event, proud to be back here in Grand Rapids. Uh, we firmly believe, firmly believe that green initiatives are a vital element in creating a vibrant 21st century community. Uh, for local officials in Michigan and really anywhere, uh, going green saves green. And we saw from Mayor Chavez what that means in communities across the country. And for local officials trying to stretch dollars, falling revenues, that's an important element today. Green initiatives are but one of eight assets that we believe are critical for creating the kinds of places people and businesses want to be in. And our Center for 21st Century Communities program is bringing strategies and tools to help local leaders grow these assets and strengthen communities. And for more on our Center for 21st Century Communities programs, I urge you to go to our website, www.mml.org, and click on the 21C3 link. As I said, I'm very pleased to be back in Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids is a founding member of the Michigan Municipal League and one of the leaders in Michigan in creating the kinds of places people want to be in. I say one because one of our other panelists, Mayor Heifchi, uh, runs another one of those cities uh, that is in the forefront of uh, sustainable practices and creating communities. And I have the pleasure today of introducing our moderator, uh, Mayor Hartwell. And we've already heard a lot about Mayor Hartwell, um, so I'll be brief as he asked me to be. Um, but uh, since his election in office in 2004, um, he has certainly taken Grand Rapids in a different direction, going green, introducing a variety of environmental measures into the agenda. Uh, as has been noted, he has gained uh, worldwide attention. In 2007, the United Nations recognized Grand Rapids as a center of expertise and sustainability. A former board member of the Michigan Municipal League, I'm very proud and pleased to introduce Mayor George Hartwell. Thanks, Arnold. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, uh, let me uh, say a special word of thanks uh, to MML, who has uh, not only uh, uh, co-sponsored this conference uh, with us, but uh, is, a, uh, is clearly providing good leadership right now in the, in the whole arena of uh, sustainability. Uh, encouraging, prodding uh, its members uh, and, and poking at the legislature when they need poking at, and they frequently need poking at. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Arnold, for, for your work. Uh, uh, the future of energy and the economy, this is, this is kind of the frontier uh, today. It's the place where, uh, where uh, in, environmental protection uh, meets uh, economic opportunity. Uh, and community well-being. It really, I think, is the defining piece of sustainability for, for our state and our cities. Now, uh, as explorers in this new frontier, we got a bit of a late start uh, here in Michigan. Uh, uh, our, our legislature uh, dithered for uh, at least two years uh, before coming up with a uh, and adopting a, a renewable portfolio standard, and, and at that, it's a it's a tepid one, but it's a it's a start, and we're running to catch up. Uh, uh, but we're a we're a state of innovators. We're a state uh, that uh, is is up for challenges. Uh, uh, we're a state that takes what we what we have, what we've been given, uh, and and we make something great out of it. Um, we have wind, we have water, we have sunshine today. We have sunshine, um, and uh, and we're taking it and and we're taking its energy rather, and 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 turning it to uh, to commerce and to improving the quality of our life. We have engineers. We have uh, institutions that train engineers. We've got a, a great brain trust in in Michigan, and we've got practitioners uh, who are who are really moving this agenda forward. I, I'm especially pleased uh, to be able to introduce to you the panel. Uh, that we've assembled for uh, for today, because these are the 
these are the innovators, they're the practitioners, they're the regulators, uh, and and uh, I want to uh, uh, I, I want to take a moment and introduce them all. In fact, I think what I'll do is is is, is just that introduce them all, starting on my uh, left and and coming across, and then we'll. We won't uh, interrupt the flow of conversation. Each speaker is going to take uh, a brief uh, five to no more than seven minutes uh, to make some comments, um, uh, and then we're going to open this up for discussion uh, and your, your questions and your comments. My first speaker, uh, Fred Keller, uh, who is the chairman and, and CEO of Cascade Engineering Company, one of our uh, state's great uh, 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 engineering firms, uh, uh, manufacturers. He founded Cascade Engineering in 1973, uh, following a career as a uh, metallurgist with uh, Pratt and Whitney. Uh, since 2002, uh, Fred has taught a graduate level course in sustainability uh, at the Johnson School of Management at Cornell University. Uh, he is a graduate of Cornell with a degree in material science and engineering and received his master's degree in business management from uh, Rensselaer uh, Polytechnic Institute. Uh, Fred is, a, uh, is a, certainly a leader in not only in our community but in the state and nation, having served on the, uh, the White House uh, Manufacturers Council. I think I've got that. Uh, close to correct anyway, and, uh, and, and, a, and a very good friend. Uh, Greg uh, White uh, is the commissioner uh, next in line here with the Michigan Public Service Commission. Uh, he was appointed by uh, Governor uh, Granholm uh, to serve on the Michigan Public Service Commission on December 4th of 2009. Um, he told me last night that uh, indeed commissioners uh, uh, survive changes of uh, state government, and uh, his term lasts until 2015. Um, Commissioner White holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Michigan State University and a Master's of Public Administration from this fine institution, Grand Valley State uh, University. Next in line is John Allen, who is the Executive uh, Director of Environmental Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs uh, at Consumers Energy Company. Uh, he um, holds an undergraduate degree in Fisheries and Wildlife and a Master's degree in Zoology from Michigan State University. Um, uh, Mr. Allen is a published author on topics related to uh, wetlands, stream ecology, uh, and impact assessment, and it's uh, it's very good to have him in that position uh, with uh, with this major utility. And and finally, uh, to to my immediate left, uh, uh, and a, a, a good friend, uh, uh, John Hefia, who's the mayor of uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, since 2000, uh, when John was elected first. Uh, uh, he has initiated efforts to uh, clean up and green the city. Um, I, I think we, in, we enjoy a, a, a sort of a wonderful uh, uh, competitive spirit among us. Uh, you know, he'll do something that I haven't done and call me up. I'll do something he hasn't done and call him up. Uh, uh, so uh, so we, we enjoy competing from across the state, uh, but also uh, sharing things that work and, and, and emulating uh, uh, practices that, that have worked. Uh, uh, after uh, winning the uh, Preservationist of the Year in 2003 and the Elected uh, Official of the Year in 2004, uh, Mayor Hefia went on to be appointed to the Michigan Climate Action Council by Governor Granholm. Uh, he received his uh, Bachelor of Science in Public Science, in Political Science, I'm sorry, from uh, Eastern Michigan University. If you'd, if you'd join me, please, uh, in, in welcoming all of these panelists, and then you'll hear first from Fred Keller. Well, thanks, George, very much. Um, think of Cascade Engineering as a multi-business manufacturer. We have uh, start, our roots were started in things like the automotive industry and, and uh, serving the office furniture industry. And we've uh, graduated through the years to many different uh, areas, including uh, the recycling and waste container industry, which we are proud to have uh, rolled out in Grand Rapids recently for the, our, our, uh, our uh, recycling containers. And we have now uh, uh, technology that helps uh, cities uh, understand where their assets are uh, in, in terms of uh, RFID tags and software and hardware. We just op opened the new joint venture in that area. And uh, it included in this, embedded in that, are some new startups which we have in the way of, of uh, renewable energy, which we've been doing for um, almost three years now with our, our wind and solar projects. And uh, we have uh, had the privilege under the, uh, the uh, reason of the renewable portfolio standard. The consumer's energy had a, a wonderful project where we 
Uh, we had a feed-in tariff. We were able to do 350 kilowatt systems uh, and several smaller systems uh, as a result of, of that, that uh, renewable portfolio standard and the, the feed-in tariff that, uh, uh, that Consumers Energy had. So there's a real uh, 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 affiliation here, aff aff affinity for the three of us uh, working together over the, the past couple of years to make these things happen. Uh, we also have a, a Water for Developing Countries uh, initiative uh, we call uh, Triple Quest, and uh, we have a Quest Sustainable Solutions group that is involved in helping communities and in businesses to become more sustainable. Uh, so we've uh, we're kind of translating what we've learned and, and uh, helping other uh, folks get there. We also do uh, have our, our Platinum LEED certified uh, office building, which we're very proud of. Uh, had the first in Michigan, maybe the eighth in the nation, existing building designation. Uh, so we're very uh, involved, in, 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 and uh, my particular personal passion is to be able to uh, find something good and figure out how to make it good business. Uh, and that's uh, that leads us to the innovative uh, solutions that we think we come up with for other organizations and, and our customers. Uh, so uh, in terms of, I heard a lot of good things in the in the uh, uh, as as the part of the beginning part of this from the standpoint of uh, community as the unit of change. Uh, I firmly believe that uh, it can be either the city or a region. Uh, in, in West Michigan, we're, in, we're encompassing maybe a region as, as, a, as a way to get change to happen. Uh, it's very important for vision and measurement to be a part of that. Uh, I certainly believe in the idea that uh, climate change is, uh, is important, and uh, there are, that's, it's a wonderful uh, argument, but it is an argument, and I think focusing on oil is a great way to get at that. Um, and uh, we can also talk about zero waste. Uh, so if there are any of these subjects that you want to talk about, I'm happy to, to uh, chime in. But zero waste for us is a reality. We used to spend $286,000 a year hauling our trash to the dump. Uh, last year we spent $4,000 and we're on our way to zero uh, at this point in time. We've got some, some ideas about how we can help uh, other organizations do that. Great. Thank you, Fred. Gary? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, certainly an honor to be part of this distinguished panel. And um, return to Grand Valley, as, as Mayor Hartwell pointed out, I am a graduate of, of this institution and, and proud of that. I'm also a resident of Grand Rapids, and I'm very proud of that. As I travel around the country and travel around the state of Michigan, I'm, I'm struck often uh, at, at how amazing this community is. And uh, all three of my children were born and raised here. And I'm very proud of that. It's a, it's a remarkable community. And I'm, Honored to be here today. Um, I, as, as Mayor Hartwell pointed out, my, my appointment to the commission is, is relatively recent, uh, December of, of 09. But I do have a long history in this business. And I've worked in oil and gas, and I've worked in nuclear power. Um, but I would like to kind of start by uh, giving a little bit of background and perspective. I was hired back in 1983. Uh, by the state of Michigan, the old Department of Commerce, to develop a sustainable renewable energy industry. Um, I certainly considered myself a massive failure in that regard. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, looking back, um, oil was uh, cheap, uh, gas was plentiful, uh, the technology wasn't particularly mature, the incentives were wrong, costs were high. I mean, it was, it was something that just wasn't really going to to work, and, and by the time I moved on, we really didn't have anything that could even be remotely called a sustainable renewable energy industry in the state of Michigan. Um, over time, uh, there were efforts to do some things. I know the Public Service Commission, at the time I was an advisor to commissioners uh, in, in the uh, about five years ago, uh, the price of natural gas skyrocketed. Consumers Energy came to the commission and, and made a request uh, to change a contract they had with a very large gas generating uh, entity uh, in hopes of not having to incur these very high natural gas costs. And part of the deal that we worked out, part of the arrangement, was that um, there would be a charge that would be used to help support the development of renewable energy. And it worked out to be a nickel per meter per month, so uh, typical uh, customer would, would get 30 cents a year uh, that they would be charged for this, um, I guess 60 cents a year, sorry, my math, that's, I was a public policy major, <laughs> um, 
anyway, the, uh, the Attorney General, in his infinite wisdom, uh, fought that, and, and we were overturned in the courts as not being able to do that. Um, so, so we had a lot of fits and starts, and, and you know, the effort to try to develop this uh, renewable energy, sustainable energy industry just really, you know, we, we were, na were never able to get anything that would work. And quite frankly, up until a couple years ago, we, other than the existing hydro systems and a handful of, of um, you know, biogas type of facilities, we really didn't have any renewable energy. Uh, consumers energy had about 5%, I think, from their their uh, hydro systems primarily, but for example, Detroit Edison had virtually nothing. So as, as the mayor pointed out, we toiled in the legislature for, for a long period of time, but eventually we came out with PA 295, uh, which, is, which contains the renewable portfolio standard uh, and also has an energy optimization or energy efficiency uh, standard in it as well. Uh, while not perfect, um, I would argue that it has given us for the first time a framework um, to really go forward and develop a renewable energy industry. And as, as all of you know, Governor Granholm has uh, made a very, very uh, significant effort to develop alternative energy and renewable energy as, as a way for Michigan to reinvent itself. And so it's critical that we successfully implement these types of programs. And I'd like to say we've been very successful at this point. Um, we're still, it's still a work in progress. Uh, the goal is 10% of our electricity generated by renewable energy by 2015. Um, and at this point in time, we are a little bit ahead of the curve and we're under what the projected cost would be. So I'd like to say that that's very much a successful uh, program. There's always the, uh, the uh, impetus to try to kick that up, uh, and, and we've had uh, proposals in the legislature groups that have su suggested that 10% is too low, um, you know, and, and that's arguable. Um, but I, I have to say that, that my goal as a commissioner is to successfully implement what we have, because in my view, nothing will uh, initiate further advancements and developments than the successful implementation of the programs that we have. And so uh, I think we're well on that way, and um, I'm very pleased to be on this panel. Look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Okay. Jeff. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks for uh, uh, having us here, and it's great to be part of the conference with our partners, our partner communities, and uh, our, 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 um, our regulatory partners as well. Um, it, it's different for us for a change to not be the oldest company in the room. We've been here only 124 years. Uh, I, I understand from uh, East Jordan, uh, Ironworks has been here about 126 or 27 years. I'm not quite sure where you guys are, but uh, we've, we've grown up in Michigan together. We certainly expect to stay here another 125 years or more. Uh, we're, we're not going away. Um, so we're, we're pleased with that. Let me see if I can generate a little bit of excitement about, about what we're doing now, not just the future. Um, as Commissioner White suggested, when you have a known and stable regulatory environment, that stimulates investment. Uncertainty, it's very hard to invest within you know, highly uncertain regulatory environments. Once that settles and you know what the rules of the game are, um, we can respond. It's very hard to respond to, um, to aspirational goals. I don't, get to, I don't get to not comply with an aspirational goal. I get to comply with the law. And in this case, we have some very distinct measures and metrics against which we can, we, we can uh, work towards. And let me give you a couple examples now of specifically what's happening within our industry and within our business and within consumers' energy. A couple of things we've announced recently, and I'm just going to kind of walk through very quickly these. In May, we announced uh, the results of our 2009 uh, environment, uh, the, um, energy efficiency or energy optimization program. Uh, we hit 134 percent of our goal for that year, so we well over exceeded what we thought we could do within the first six months of that program. That included 7,000 new furnace installations. Really, we think uh, almost saved that whole industry sector at a time when the economy was just in real trouble. Uh, 800,000 CFLs were installed. 2,600 refrigerators and freezers were pulled out, old ones, uh, to replace with new energy efficient appliances. So these are very real things. We're looking at maybe 170,000 residents participated and almost 9,500, almost 10,000 businesses participated, roughly within the first six months of the program. I think you'll see the same kinds of progress. So with an EO goal, 
under PA 295, you're starting to see real progress in these areas, and, and we'll continue to see these programs grow. I think uh, next year, this year we're projecting in the uh, $27 million worth of spending for energy efficiency programs just in the residential sector that grows to $41 million by 2011. So these programs are ramping up, they're gearing up. Um, now the costs are, are, are pretty modest at this point, but we're also going after the low-hanging fruit. We'll probably see those costs increase over time as you get harder and harder, get into more and more difficult types of energy efficiency. In June, we announced an agreement for 240 megawatts. 240 megawatts, that's a power plant. That's a huge power plant size for renewable energy. Um, it was, it's, it's a contract with John Deere for, um, uh, for development of, of industrial scale, large scale renewables in both San, in San Lac, Huron, and Lenawee counties. Uh, now, if you if you looked at the notes recently or the news, John Deere has sold to Exelon Corporation, or is pending sale, I guess, to Exelon Corporation. So there's now another dominant energy company entering the Michigan market, partly under the stability of this regulatory environment that we have. People understand what that investment looks like, what the offtake agreements look like, what the, so they can value their investments versus other investments. So you'll see Exelon enter the Michigan market, assuming that that sale consummates. In July, we announced contracts with Vestas, which is a wind generation, a turbine generator, uh, pending, pending final contract, pending, pending commission approval for 56 wind turbines at a, a wind farm that we're developing over in the Mason County area called Lake Winds. So these are all real things. These aren't proposals for the future. These are real projects that are happening now with real contracts and real commitments of, of hundreds of millions of dollars. And in fact, we're talking about billions of dollars uh, to, to to meet the commitments under PA 295 and to really move Michigan ahead into environmental uh, performance, uh, greenhouse gas reduction, energy efficiency space. So all these are really happening now. Um, we proposed and the commission approved an LED tariff for street lighting. So if a community decides that it's in their best interest, as Ann Arbor and others have, to install LED lighting, there is now a tariff against which those lights can be charged. There hadn't been in the past. So there's another aspect of really moving ahead and providing sort of the regulatory and operational uh, aspects that we can, we can really start to pull this together. I will mention parenthetically that if, if you've seen in the news recently, General Electric just announced the closure of their last plant in the United States, in Virginia. 200 jobs are going to go away in Virginia. It's the last plant in the United States that manufactures incandescent light bulbs. With most of the CFLs being uh, manufactured offshore or overseas or in China. Mm -hmm. so, so these decisions we make do have other consequences. So we have, to, we have to factor a lot of things in as we make these decisions. But here's 200 U.S. jobs going away. But we're also uh, transitioning from incandescent lights to CFL lights and other types of lighting LEDs. There's certainly entrepreneurial opportunities within lighting um, uh, as, we, as we look ahead. We're continuing our work on smart grid. Uh, doing a lot of upfront work. It's not, it's not flashy work at this point. It's not a lot of you know, announcements of this project and that project, although those will be forthcoming in the, in the future as we have some pilots already underway in Jackson. Smart Grid is really building intelligence within the infrastructure, both on the home side and in the distribution and transmission systems to understand power flows, to increase efficient, efficient use, and to provide communications and price signals to, to customers. Uh, we, we have filed a tariff for plug-in electric vehicles. So as PEVs hit the market this fall, customers will be able to respond and pay for their energy within PEVs in that space. There's another entrepreneurial point of entry. Um, and then uh, Fred had mentioned the Experimental Advanced Renewable Program, EARP, ERP, probably not the best name, maybe the second worst name up here. But, yeah. um, but we have this program for two megawatts of solar, principally really around the, the, the initiation of some solar technologies within Michigan that a number of Michigan businesses have availed themselves, and residential. Uh, we are paying over market for that. There is a subsidy associated with that program. We have to be careful. We talked about the Grand Rapids school systems having 80% poverty rates. So we really have to be very cognizant of what the effects of these programs are on our customers. There's not an unlimited capacity within Michigan and within our customers to pay for all the things that we may think or like especially if those things we think and like are more expensive than the ones we have now. We have to be deeply cognizant of the effects on low income, uh, uh, rental populations, and a variety of others. I mean, poverty is still 
a, a major component of the U.S. landscape, certainly as a component of Michigan's landscape. And we have to be, as well as our regulators and our legislators and our communities, have to be deeply cognizant of the effects of energy uh, writ large on poverty and on people that are really struggling to, to buy groceries. Um, there's other things on the list. I think I'll pass on that because I don't want to use up all the time. Here, okay, so. thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, Mayor. Well, thank you, Mayor. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to be in Grand Rapids, uh, and I've been uh, really enjoying my time here in the city, as I always do. And I really appreciate being invited to be in the conference and, and to be with, uh, with this distinguished panel. Let me point out, introduce a couple of our staff members who joined us today, and that's Andrew Bricks. He heads up our, uh, our energy office. Andrew has some big shoes to fill. His predecessor, Dave Conkle, has been hired by ICLE to <laughs> go around North America and teach other cities about what Ann Arbor does. Uh, around energy, and Matt Nott is with us today. Matt heads up our whole environmental section, and I was glad that they could join us. Thank you for being here, and if you get a chance to talk to them, uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to exchange any information with you. In Ann Arbor, we're, like Grand Rapids, attacking the triple bottom line, and we've been doing this aggressively for a number of years. Uh, I was taken by John's comments there at the end about how there are people in our state who are struggling. Uh, one of the things that we've managed to do in this economy and I, I was talking with Mayor Chavez about this. When George and I are somewhere else and we're talking with mayors of another state, and they talk about, oh, this economy and how tough it is, uh, we can relate to that. Because in, in Michigan, it seems as if this recession's been going on forever. Now, I know we've been cutting our budget since around 2002. But one of the things that we've maintained is we haven't cut our funding to human services. We've continued to sustain that funding in the face of, uh, of a very tough economy. We haven't raised our millage rate. It's actually incrementally lower than it was in 2000. So we've been doing everything we can as a city to save money for those, uh, for our taxpayers and for those people who just can't afford anything else. But it's remarkable, I think, that like so many other cities, we've been able to move forward in a wide range of areas towards sustainability. Um, energy is certainly one of them. Uh, we're converting our entire bus fleet over to hybrids. Uh, we're, we're giving a free bus pass to anyone who works in the downtown area. We've expanded our bicycling system by 500 percent, I'm sorry, 600 percent in five years uh, so that we can bring more and more people into our core without their automobiles. We continue to work for commuter rail to connect all of southeast Michigan. Actually, we have some, some light perhaps at the end of the tunnel on that one as, as things are moving along. Uh, so that we could have commuter rail on top of our Amtrak service. We continue to look at improving recycling. Like Grand Rapids, I believe you're going to a single stream now, and we've been a top-tier recycling community for a long time. We've taken advantage of a new hybrid technology that puts the, uh, the braking in the vehicle is actually charging a hydraulic system to thrust the recycling truck to its next stop. And so we've taken advantage of that. Uh, much less expensive than what we do with our buses. So across the, the range of opportunities, uh, we continue to do everything we can to become more efficient. We've recently achieved 20% uh, renewable energy for our municipal operations. And in a large way, we haven't created much more uh, in the way of energy. We certainly have installed some solar. We were named Solar City USA, one of 25 in the nation. I think we're sort of the Midwest test uh, to see if solar will work along with Madison, and, and so far I can report that it's working well. But most of our work has been in reducing our energy load and in conservation, and that has allowed uh, the renewables that we do have from a couple of old hydro dams, from our landfill gas, uh, from the other, some of the other things we're plugging into that, to get us to that level because of conservation. And that's where we see a great opportunity. Our LED street lighting program uh, has been making great progress. And yet, one of the problems we have in this regulatory environment is there's really nothing we can do to force our utility, which is DTE, and they own two-thirds to three-quarters of our streetlights, to take on a technology. And I think from their point of view, this is going to reduce uh, the amount of electricity that they are selling in an off-peak time at night. Uh, so it's been tough sledding in that way. But we are busy converting all of the city-owned streetlights. We've completed the downtown. And now we're moving out into our neighborhoods and the streetlights that we do own. And that's a program that is very much appreciated. But from my work on the Climate Action Council, where John was there and, uh, and George was there, uh, we see a great opportunity to spread that type of thing across the state of Michigan. I'm happy to see that building codes are being looked at. 
Uh, happy to hear that today. Uh, some one of the recommendations that came out of the Climate Action Council. But imagine an LED lighting standard for every new shopping center that was installed. Imagine an, a new, an LED standard for every new street light that goes up or when you replace that bulb, you need to bring in an LED. Uh, the U of M School of Business did a study of our LED program and came back and told us that that's a four-year payback. Uh, we invest in a water pipe that we hope is going to last 75 years. When we can take advantage of a four-year payback, uh, something that is going to continue to pay back our taxpayers for years and years to come because we're looking at a life of those LEDs that may range from 12 to 18 years um, because they haven't been in place so long that they go out quite that far uh, with this particular model. Maybe it's going to be 20. We don't know that. But after four years, we begin to save money. Uh, and that is an investment that makes sense from a municipal standpoint. I think it makes sense from a business standpoint. I think it would make sense across this state. We're here to talk about today and talk about how energy and the economy and what could be done. And Michigan doesn't have to look far. We have a portfolio standard now, but it is, as George said, it's, it's tepid to say the best about it. It is filled with loopholes that pretty much say that if you can't make money on it, you really don't have to do it if it doesn't work economically for you. And that's, a, that's an important bottom line to keep in mind. But all we really need to do is look across Lake Huron and across Lake Superior and see what's happening in Ontario, where they have their own version of, of province-wide feed-in tariffs. Um, it's frustrating to me to be in Sault Ste. Marie, and I'm through there a fair amount of time, and look across the lake. It's just about 12 miles away. There's a wind farm with 126 1.5 megawatt windmills. Well, I don't think the wind's any different on that side of the lake 12 miles away than it is on our side of the lake. Um, and if you want to take a look at what's going on over on the Lake Huron side, or you can take a look at the multiple megawatt solar plants that are planned and moving forward in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, Ontario, and in Sarnia, Ontario, I, I believe they're up to something like they're, they're predicting a 100 megawatt production over there. Uh, so there's a whole lot more that we could be doing. And then we look at the economy. When those windmills were going up in Sault Ste. Marie, the Algoma steel plant, it's about a 110-year-old steel plant there that you can see when you go over the bridge, uh, they're turning out towers. They're putting on a whole new assembly line, a whole new line to turn these out. In Michigan, we know how to build things like turbines. We can make uh, rotors. Uh, we, can, we know how to bend steel here in this state. We know how to do grand projects. All you have to do is go over the Mackinac Bridge. We seem to have forgotten, uh, it seems to me, and have been bogged down for many years until recently in trying to say, let's keep doing it the way we always used to do it. But there's a whole new frontier out there. Uh, we could be a leader. We're looking at uh, railroads, for instance, getting a little bit away from energy into transportation. We could certainly build railroads in the state of Michigan. Uh, we're looking at the time when gasoline is up to 5 $6 a gallon. And how many people in this room could guarantee me that's not going to happen as the world economies come back, as just before the the things really fell apart. We were looking at $4 gasoline. Take a look at European prices or prices in other countries. How are people going to get to work? In Ann Arbor, 70,000 people come to work every single day uh, from outside of the city. Another 35,000 leave. How are they going to get there? How are the employers going to survive uh, when their people are coming from Jackson and they're driving 40 miles into the city? There are so many more things that our state could be doing. When I hear about our RPS and I hear about what it is we're doing, uh, we need to get our heads out of the sand again and take another look about what's going around. And as I say, we don't have to look very far. There's so much more that could be done here in our state. And uh, I share with Mayor Chavez um, his frustration with what's happening in Washington, D.C. Um, our country doesn't have an energy plan. Our country continues to buy foreign oil. And we here in Michigan, we continue to spend over $20 billion a year leaving our state to purchase coal. And yet we're still having to talk about new coal-fired power plants. And there's so many examples around what we could be doing with conservation, what we could be doing with renewables. All of these things could be spurring our economy uh, to revive what's going on in Michigan and to put more people to work. I'm really gratified to hear about what Consumers is doing. I think they're ahead of DTE. I think they're doing more. We have had a standing offer now for five years on the table that says to a utility that we will pay, we will sign a 20-year contract 
for Michigan-produced renewable energy that could be brought into our city. And so far, nobody's taken us up on it. It's a standing offer. Uh, it's been out there for a while. I've talked about it many times. Uh, Andrew talks about it with the utilities. Nobody's taken us up on it. A 20-year contract. Uh, I think we have a, one of the best credit ratings in the state. We're guaranteed to pay. Uh, we're going to continue to keep the lights on. And yet we haven't seen these types of changes. And it is, as you've heard so many times today, uh, it's happening in local communities like Grand Rapids. It's happening in Ann Arbor, but we need help. Uh, all of us do. We could do so much more in our cities, and we could turn this state around if we truly embraced this drive for renewable energy, this drive for trying to hit that triple bottom line. And I got to tell you something else, and we, we've, uh, uh, in fact, uh, Mayor Chavez mentioned uh, uh, some of the work that's been done by Richard Florida and some of the other authors that we might tap into about what attracts the creative community to your, com to your town. And it has so much to do with being having clean energy in your city, with having, uh, like we do, uh, a great park system, with having all sorts of arts and amenities that Grand Rapids and Ann Arbor are both moving so rapidly to being some of the premier cities in the country in this area. But companies and the individuals, the talented people that make the new economy work are attracted to all these things. And if Michigan continues to be considered a rusting Rust Belt state, uh, it's not going to work here. It's going to work in a few places. It's going to work in Ann Arbor. It's going to work in Grand Rapids. It might work in Traverse City. But it is not going to work statewide until we've made some more fundamental changes than we've made to date. There needs to be uh, some new endeavors. Uh, the legislature has got to wake up. As citizens, we have to send the right people to Lansing and the right people to Washington, D.C. And we can begin to turn the corner. Because I don't think we've got to start. Uh, you know, maybe we're a little bit into the corner, but we have a whole long ways to go, and uh, the work that's being done in cities can continue, I think, to lead not just Michigan, but this country along. But the uh, folks in Lansing and the folk, folks in Washington have got to get on board. Great. Thanks very much, Mayor. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you've heard from each of the panelists. This would be an opportunity to uh, ask questions, make comments. Uh, uh, if you would, uh, if you would address your your question to uh, a, a particular panelist, uh, that would be helpful. We've got uh, about ten minutes. Yes, right over here. Mr. White, you want to take the first crack at that? Uh, certainly. Um, it, it is something that we're, we're paying a lot of attention to. Um, it, however, there are some issues that, that do have to be worked through, uh, some legal issues um, and some proprietary issues. Um, it was very interesting uh, about a, 10 years ago when Michigan uh, made an effort to get into uh, more of a competitive generation environment. Uh, customer choice, if you will, the ability to choose. Um, a lot of the information that may have been public information or information that would be easy to gather all of a sudden was being pulled back because it was proprietary and because you know a competitor could say, well, gee, now I can cherry pick customers and figure out you know, who uses what. So, so those are issues we are working through. We are working with the utilities. We're working with the legislature on some of those. But I think, I think that 
What's really going to drive this, in my view, is the technological advancements. Um, smart grid, um, and, and there are issues there as well. Uh, we could talk for hours just on, on smart grid alone, but uh, one of the several potential benefits of having a smart grid is, in fact, having that kind of data uh, being readily available. Uh, again, some of the questions that we have to work through is then who, in fact, owns that data? Uh, you know, how available can it be? Um, I agree with you that um, as a customer, it should be a no-brainer that my energy use should be, you know, something that I, I clearly understand. Uh, in certain circumstances, that is the case. In, in larger entities, it's not quite that, that easy and clear. But I guess without going into a lot of detail, this is something we are paying a lot of attention to because we recognize um, you're, you're going to get a better uh, implementation of energy efficiency, energy optimization, which, you know, make no bones about it, is, is clearly our best uh, resource, our best opportunity for dramatic savings, whether you're talking about climate change issues, whether you're talking about the economy. Um, we need to have those kinds of technologies in place and that kind of data available because it will drive uh, those kinds of successes. But again, there are some issues that we do have to work through both on the legal side um, and you know, proprietary type of issues. Jamie, anything you'd add? Yeah, a couple that? things. One is in individuals' energy use records are sacrosanct. That those are customer records. That, you know, just just as yours are and yours are, those are not shared publicly. Those are those are individual issues of privacy, as we talked about. Now, any customer, municipal, individual, residential business, should know what their energy use is, either in the aggregate or you know, on their series of facilities. So I, I would put a fair amount of that burden or onus on the municipality, on that entity, the customer, the business, whoever it is, to really understand what that bill looks like. Um, it, it's, I don't think that's incumbent necessarily on the utility to publish those individuals energy use or businesses or others and put those on the internet. I think I think we're going to have some pretty significant concerns broadly, not just the utility, but broadly within our customer base. However, we've also initiated just this month that we're coming out with a new energy bill. We've been working with the commission for the last year really to try to redesign consumers energy's bill. I don't know when the last design of it was, but it's going to have much more information about what energy use looked like. Uh, 13 months rolling average with a chart on it so you can start to really connect energy related use. We will ultimately get to much more of an understanding of energy use when we do get to smart grid and can look at energy use much more on a on an almost an instantaneous basis. Let, let's see if we can get one more question in here if, if uh, it's all right. I know this is a uh, fruitful conversation. Mayor? Um, I'm intrigued to hear that uh, the uh, Michigan Public Service Commission at the Sooners got their act together relative to LED street lighting, at least that's what I heard somebody say up there. Uh, we've been frustrated for the last several years and going to both parties and both parties say you got to talk to consumers. No, consumer says you got to talk to the Public Service Commission and nothing happens with LED street lightings. I also sense the frustration from my, my colleague from Ann Arbor about that whole thing. Uh, could you speak in a little more detail? Maybe you don't have the detail, but what you can oh, offer the mayors and the, the cities in this in this great state, what are we doing with LEDs for streetlights? Well, let me go first, if you don't mind, John. Um, I'm happy to. First of all, the, the, the tariff that the commission uh, ordered in, in January of, of this year, we, we issued an order directing the utilities in the state of Michigan to develop uh, a street lighting tariff that takes into account advanced technologies. Uh, it's generally referred to as the LED tariff, but in fact it includes any kind of advanced uh, induction lighting. There's a lot of technologies out there, uh, and we didn't want to exclude anything because, in fact, we have a significant manufacturer of induction lighting here in Michigan, and we want to try to help help, help them uh, move on that. Um, but clearly, you know, part of, part of the problem with that is the way street lighting was set up. We have the majority of the street lighting is, in fact, owned by the utilities, and it was done on a cost of service type of a tariff um, where the utility would maintain it, uh, you know, the, the municipality would simply pay a, a charge. Uh, we have a, a portion, I can't remember the exact amount, but let's say about a quarter, uh, maybe a little bit less, of the municipalities own their own street lighting. And so they were under a little bit different tariff. 
uh, one of the unintended consequences of the energy package that was passed in 2008, uh, PA-286, requires all customers uh, to be at cost of service, okay, um, by 2013. And there was some discounts, some circumstances where certain customer classes were subsidizing the rates of other customer classes. One of the um, <clears throat> unintended consequences of that initiative, which was in PA 286, uh, was that the street lighting got, got an increase in the rates. And I've been in contact with several communities, uh, talking with Ann Arbor, talking with the uh, city of Warren, uh, several communities where, where they saw their uh, street lighting bills go up by significant amounts, $200,000 a year. Uh, these are communities that are you know, working very hard to try to keep their, I don't have to tell you this, I'm pre preaching to the choir, but working hard to manage your budgets and all of a sudden you get this big increase. Um, and so, so it's very important that we, we get those tariffs done right. As you invest in the street lighting, you need to <laughs> receive the savings for that. And under the old tariff, the, the old model, that just wasn't how that was going to work um, because the tariffs didn't reflect the technology or even the usage, but rather was more of, you know, here's the cost per pole, per light, and this is how, how that was done. So we needed to change fundamentally. Uh, one final question, please. I apologize. No, that's fine. We can follow uh, up yes. with you later. In, in relation to consumers' uh, program that they rolled out for commercial and residential for efficiency, you alluded to the success of that program, and I agree, it's been very successful. Yes. Uh, my yes. question is, uh, in view of how rapidly that's subscribed every year up until now, and you kind of have to be ready on day one to submit your projects or you won't get on the list, what would it take to expand that for maybe more impact for a longer period of time and perhaps... Uh, Perhaps uh, Greg has something to say about that, too. Well, what, what could we do to make that more available so it doesn't run out so quick? Well, as, as, the, uh, as the commissioner mentioned, nothing breeds success like success. So we want to make sure that we understand the dynamic. We've had six months in this program, now a year, I guess, with six months into this year. So we really want to understand the dynamics. There were some very early, very successful programs. Part of those were coupled between the utility subsidies as well as the federal subsidies, on, especially on the furnace side. Substantial $1,500 you know, additional federal subsidies. So really trying to understand the, the complexities and the details of how customers behave, what they're really looking for. I, I, they have been successful, and they have been subscribed fairly quickly. Um, and, it's, and it's important to know when those offerings are going to come up and get in line. But we also have to realize, you know, is that sustainable over time, and what does that look like? It, it's another thing to expand the program and then find out that it's falling short. So we want to make sure that we're on track, that we're within the framework of the program, that we have an understanding of what those programs look like. And as they become successful, we'll continue to look very hard at, at what the, the future of those looks like. I'm not sure the time is yet to do that. Uh, Fred Keller, two minutes or less, uh, the impact of uh, the state RPS on your particular business and on business in Michigan. Uh, uh, the Renewable Portfolio Standard has been uh, good for business from, the, from our renewable energy standpoint because it allows us to do projects like the, the one we talked about from, that has a feed-in tariff associated with it. Uh, it teaches us how to do these projects in a local environment, and now we're able to do these things nationally. We're expanding our, our solar as a result of this project to the point where we're now doing national distribution of solar. Uh, and we are uh, also doing some uh, medium-sized wind projects now uh, nationally, so it's, it's helping us be a platform for, for national expansion. Yeah, good, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, help me thank the panelists here this morning. John, next. Uh, thank you, thank you, all of you. We appreciate it very much. We are going to take a, an 